unsolved crimes newspaper as a response to Cavalier civil society organization within the framework of a struggle against religious extremism presents Jonathan Mahoney, Doctor of Philosophy, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Kansas State University, United States, Kansas. Uh, Dr. Mahoney, uh, do you think it's a real problem, cults and sects, or it's uh, more uh, some labels? So I think as a general rule, when representatives of government or state organizations use the term cult, they are drawing upon exaggerated fears and exaggerated threats. So almost always threats from alleged cults are exaggerated far beyond what reality would support. So there may be some isolated cases in which an individual or a small group of people are brainwashed, so to speak, or against their will. But that happens so infrequently, and it's so rare that, in general, the government can handle these kinds of problems by using its normal policing resources to go after criminals. So in that respect, I think when members of governments or state organizations or NGOs talk about religious minorities as if they were cults, they are engaging, engaging in unjustified fear-mongering and almost always are expressing an attitude that is not compatible with democratic values, most important of which is freedom of expression and liberty of conscience. So in that respect, to talk about cults is almost always a politically motivated strategy by people who want to exaggerate fear in order to restrict liberty. Till the middle of the 20th century, we don't see any hysteria about anti-sect movements. I mean, there were numerous people as Castaneda, Hubbard, Leopold, Zondi or Shaw. But uh, in 1960s, 70s, anti-cults uh, movement's tendency became active. Why do you think this happened? So, I think probably there are two, two primary reasons for the paradigm shift in the way people think about religious practices such that people begin to make a distinction between so-called legitimate religious practices and so-called cults. And one reason I think is that during this time period there were several very high-profile cases of religious groups that engaged in rather extreme activity. So the most well-known example is probably the case of Jim Jones and the mass suicide in Latin America in which, I forget the numbers, but something like 1,000 people were killed by either voluntarily or by force, it's not quite clear, drinking uh, a soft drink that was laced with cyanide. So you had this extreme event that was widely reported in media. Uh, and so that put into people's minds this idea that maybe there are dark forces at work in our society that are trying to trick people into joining these cults. So I think that is one reason. Another reason is, and this is I think a more interesting and more important consideration, is that in the 60s and 70s in North America and Europe, there was a lot of exploration on the part of young people who were interested in leaving the religious identity of their parents. and exploring non-traditional forms of religious identity. So in America, for instance, at this time, many people became interested in Asian religion, so Buddhism and Hinduism, transcendental meditation and so forth, became very popular among the so-called hippie generation. And I think those changes were perceived by people who favor traditional religious identity as a threat. So anytime you have a moderate or a large group of the population that is interested in exploring new conceptions of religious identity, it's almost inevitable that those who defend traditional conceptions of religious identity are going to perceive that as a threat and are likely to use these changes to make exactly
exaggerated claims about the rising tide of cults or dark forces that are mysteriously operating, you know, behind the scenes trying to brainwash children. And so these threats get exaggerated and they're given the appearance of credence by these high profile cases where a few people either engage in a bank robbery in the name of some extreme cause or in the very rare case there might be a mass suicide. Okay, uh, before our interview we sent you some book. Book about Scandalous uh -huh. International Organization Factories. Please uh, give me your own opinion and uh, what do you think about their activities? So I think we should be very concerned about the activities of an organization like FECRIS, which is officially an NGO, but in practice receives most of its financial support from the French government. So the fact that this organization is receiving so much money from a state is one source of concern, I believe, because it would be one thing if this was simply an organization in civil society that was run by private members, private citizens, who were simply expressing their own personal beliefs about Pentecost, Scientologists, or any number of other groups. So were it an independent, fully autonomous organization in civil society, I would treat it in a different way than I'm inclined to regard an organization that's state-sponsored. So since it's state-sponsored, I think that makes the, the activities of FECRAS more problematic. For one, I don't think governments, as a rule, should be in the business of making judgments about which religious groups are legitimate and which religious groups are illegitimate. This is a question for individuals to decide for themselves. So in a democratic society, I favor state neutrality. Does such organization as FECRIS exist in USA? No. So the, the closest analogy to an organization like FECRIS would be organizations run by private citizens without support by the government. And there are organizations that are committed to expressing exaggerated fears about Islam. So Islamophobia is a serious problem right now in America. So there are a number of organizations in civil society that often use media and are sometimes supported by media to promote stereotypes and false beliefs about minority religious groups within America. And the current minority group that is most likely to be subject to this treatment in America, of course, are Muslims. It is also true that sometimes high-profile American politicians lend support to these groups. So there are isolated cases of individual politicians or small groups of politicians who support these activities. So maybe the best example from the standpoint of uh, politicians who are promoting this approach in contemporary American politics would be Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, who are the two leading Republican presidential candidates. And both of these candidates have come out multiple times speaking against Islam and expressing Islamophobia. So Donald Trump has said he wants to restrict immigration to prevent Muslims from entering the United States. And Ted Cruz has argued that we need to provide extra surveillance for communities in the United States where there are large populations of Muslims. These are sentiments that, in my judgment, are not compatible with religious freedom. These are judgments that stem from people who have phobias or fears that are far exaggerated beyond what the situation justifies. But we have to understand that there is a religion views yeah, and there is a crime cases. I think that is an important distinction. So, instead of targeting criminal activity that's perpetrated by members of religious groups by focusing on their religious identity, 
the focus should be on their criminal activity. And the reason for that is that in almost every case, religious groups are very diverse. And so we don't want to promote the stereotype that all Muslims are committed to religiously motivated violence, or that all members of a particular religious group hold the same belief, because that's almost always false. So the approach should focus on the criminal activities of a group or individuals and not the religious identity of the group. Strangely, Alexander Dvorkin happens to be a vice president of FECOS. Correspondingly, he supports its values and objectives. How would you describe the activities of Alexander Dvorkin? So, um, one thing that I would emphasize as an important uh, consideration is I would recommend focusing less attention on an individual like Alexander Dvorkin and instead focus more on the policies and positions that he defends because it's the policies and the positions that people like Alexander Dvorkin defend that I think are of most concern. And so my way of thinking about the role of a figure like Dvorkin is it's problematic because you have an individual who has all these connections to government organizations and dominant religious institutions, in this case the Russian Orthodox Church, who is using his role as a member of Thepris to, I would put it this way, spread propaganda about religious minorities that pose almost no threat whatsoever to the political order. And so that's very problematic because on the one hand he represents the majority religious culture which is being supported through Fekris, but on the other hand, he's promoting exaggerated fears about religious minorities that are no 